This is Otaku Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We dig deep into the great anime of the past to give you the context you need to fully appreciate the best this medium has to offer. Let's jam. Welcome to the broadcast. I hope you're having a good day, wherever you happen to be right now. This is Otaku Station, where today we'll be talking about the fourth episode of Isao Takahata's adaptation of Anne of Green Gables. Now, you may be wondering why I'm down here in the cafe area of the broadcast tower. Well, I've got Sarah coming over. You may remember her. She's that teenage girl who's been eager to help out here at the tower. I'm going to get her to help replanting the garden outside. And I've already got some carrot and lettuce seedlings in the ground and uh, made the rounds with the neighbors and gathered a few more things. Uh, old Miss Lindhurst has a bunch of apple and cherry tree seedlings. So maybe in a decade or two, we can do some anime broadcasts amidst Falling cherry blossoms, how appropriate for anime. Anyway, I'm just about done prepping here, and so when Sarah gets here, I'll start her on the weeding. And all this talk about farming got me thinking about Matthew in Anne of Green Gables, so let's head up to the research room for a character spotlight on him. All right, let's talk about Matthew in Anne of Green Gables, Matthew Cuthbert, and particularly the role that he plays in the story. And we can understand that by looking at his personality. Matthew is this interesting contrast of elements. He's emotionally sensitive, taking on the kind of stereotypical mother role among the two parents in, a, in Anne's life. But he's also awkward around women, particularly little girls, and not particularly good at talking with men either. He's a quiet, reserved person. Why? Why did Montgomery decide to write him that way? Well, I think there are three things that make Matthew an effective character here. And the first is to make a point about Anne. Anne is such a remarkable person that she breaks through to even someone like Matthew. Remember, Matthew is the first person that we see really interact with Anne to, for any length of time. It's a marker of Anne's personality that she can get through to somebody even as reserved as Matthew. Um, in other words, a reserved character like Matthew shows us Anne in contrast and also how she consistently causes other people to have at least some reaction to her. And in his case, uh, particularly love and care. Secondly, as the story progresses, he provides an important psychological release valve for the viewer, not even so much for Anne, who I think isn't really aware of this. Anne isn't alone at Green Gables with the unimaginative and work-focused Marilla. We know that if Anne ever feels too restricted, she always has a sympathetic ear in Matthew. We know it'll never get too bad for Anne because Matthew's there. And being a reserved, quiet person, he can listen to her without judgment. And also, thirdly, Matthew does correct Marilla in very gentle ways a couple of times in the show when he feels she's being a bit too strict. So we get to see the healthy dynamic of two parents who are trying their best with this remarkable situation. So those are a few things that I think make Matthew a particularly effective choice for that particular personality in that role in the story. Let's head on back up. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Quick update. Unfortunately, Sarah got a little enthusiastic in the garden. You might remember that I had some vegetable seedlings already in the ground. Well, she was so fired up about helping out and weeding that she weeded right over into those seedlings and pulled up half of them before I even noticed. <sighs> Poor thing feels awful. And 
I've given her a big croissant and planted her down in front of the anime screen where she can watch some Sailor Moon in peace and hopefully recover. Anyway, let's move on from one sad girl to another. Uh, you may remember when we watched the first three episodes of this last season, those ended just as Anne was being driven away from Green Gables to be returned to the orphanage. So let's get Steve and John on the line to pick up right there. All right, it looks like we have both Steve and John on the line. Everything good for you guys out there? Everything crystal clear. Everything's foggy, but good. Whatever works. Let's get into it. <laughs> I'm always wonder. I'm always curious is why have they made Anne without the buggy? Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a normal yeah. two two wheeled buggy would just mm -hmm. be it'd be a seat, two wheels, the harness, and everything else. But yeah. they have so minimalized it mm -hmm. that it's beautiful the way it, you know, it blends with her dress. It blends with the you know the atmosphere of it. And it gives it the very minimalist presentation. Yeah. Lets you see more of Anne as a figure moving through the space. Mm -hmm. But it's still such an interesting visual stylistic choice. Yeah. It's like, it, ah. it really gets to the imagination, right? Where yeah. she's flying through this. It's it's very dreamlike. Yeah. Just that look of like I had a home. Yeah. For a little bit. Bit. Uh, it was nice. I had trees. Now I'm going back to a desolate yard yeah. with one dead tree in it, like the soul. My heart. Yeah. She had her own room. Uh, she had, you know what I mean, all those things that she had dreamed of yeah. to go back. And I'm like, ah, oh, crushing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she talked, you know, in the last episode about how she she doesn't want to hold on to it. She, you know, remember she refused to play because I, I you know, she can't attach herself to this. And she's still in that mindset where she's trying right. to suck it up. Yeah. Mm. But you, but just that whole literal yeah. physically turn around and look and it's like you feel the longing in that in that look sure do it's like oh mm. i'm depressed again mm. <laughs> i'm depressed yeah mm. which i think we we discussed this before it's like the period setting and commitment to the period setting absolutely yeah they wanted a boy and is not a boy mm-hmm and then there is like the sort of modern sensibility of Anne is a pair of hands. Any farm family anywhere mm. at this period of time, it didn't matter what child mm. there was. They all could milk. They all could do whatever needed to be done. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of surprising. It's like, no, send her back. Get a farm boy. Well, it, in fairness, I think they're also thinking more in terms of the future. They, they need to let, the, let this person have to inherit the farm. Which again, at that period of time, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which unfortunately, the modern niceties are like, she can inherit property. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the um, time, she couldn't even yeah. vote. <laughs> and again, to be clear, women owned property back then, right? It's just this, this was not the norm. It, it was yeah, a very right. exceptional circumstance. So um, usually you had to be like left to the property. Right. Yeah. Um, hus husband dies. You've right. got the property now, or mm -hmm. your family specifically leaves you a piece yeah. of property for a reason. Um, and that's the other thing is that, like, as the novel makes clear later, you know, it's not that they couldn't adopt Anne and leave the house to her, and she would own the house, and that would be perfectly legal. You know, um, right. it's that that wasn't what was in Marilla's head. Right. And she just can't let that version of things go, and because that is the most effective solution. Right. She's just latched on to that is the way we have to do it. Which is what I like about the story and right. the anime in general is where you see character growth. Yeah. Where we're only at the stage now where she is very channelized. Mm -hmm. Boy does farm. Girl does not. Yeah. Fix this. Expedient means to an end. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, but then we get growth. Yep, exactly. Also, should be pointed out the kind of interesting sort of stereotype reversal, where she Marilla is the very rational one, while Matthew is the emotional one. Kind of funny. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's really good. He's much more attachment oriented than Marilla is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, slightly. <laughs> yeah. She's the type to like go and see 
like old yeller sitting out there and Matthew is going to be like, no, it's my beloved dog. She'll be like, shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Actually, she'll geez, be like, look, 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 just give me the gun. Me <laughs> yeah. I'll get You're you not capable of manning up to this, dog. but I'll do it. Dog. Yeah. It's all exactly. Yep. Yikes. Look how we're comparing putting down a dog to getting rid of man. <laughs> I mean, emotionally, it's kind of yeah. that way. It's like, what a horrible thing to do to something that should be loved. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Just pointing out the lovely little animation technique here where they have two backgrounds. Mm -hmm. and they are making one go up slightly over the other one to give that sense of the horizon receding. Um it takes effort to do that. You have to cut out all of those little um, uh, posts, you know, to make that work. So it's interesting they're doing here. Remember last episode, we <clears> stayed <throat> with Matthew and saw his emotional reaction to that and how shattered he was emotionally. Now we're leaving that and focusing on Marilla and Anne's journey. And to that point, opposite directions. Mm. So Matthew's bringing her in. Mm. As, and making that emotional journey in where he starts to connect with her even on just that short journey to the farm mm -hmm. and now this is Marilla's sort of emotional journey yeah you know what I mean it's like there's this last opportunity for her alone with Anne mm -hmm. to make the connection that mm -hmm. Matthew made with Anne on the way in yeah great point So, um, I also appreciate the time Takahata gives us to recover emotionally from Anne's, you know, calling out and so forth and so on. We get that, those few moments of, of just watching this happen and sort of primes us for the next emotional beat. Mm. It's important. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, have to, <laughs> <laughs> I have to praise Marilla's expression here because it does show uh, her emotional openness to what's happening to Anne. Like, she realizes you should be miserable right now. Yeah. That's a loaded oh my God. just right she there, man. There. Holy yeah. crap. <laughs> my life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks, and, Marilla. You're just adding one more tombstone to the graveyard. Yep. Well, and I'm glad you guys brought that up because on the one hand, it's very true. On the one hand, it's this... It's, Anne's wonderful sort of over-the-top poeticism. Yeah, and then, then uh, um, it c combines all those things. Lovely. Lovely way. It also is the... It, it's, it's a child's sort of and mixed with an adult perspective. Mm -hmm. Oh, the roses are, are so beautiful. They're pink, and wouldn't it be great if they could talk? And, oh, the things I must be able to say... And then that sudden sort of snap, mm -hmm. well, you know, oh, my hair color won't change, so I guess that's another hope gone. Where yeah. it's like, oh, wow, from youthful exuberance mm -hmm. to this stark reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. I, like, one, you know, to, when <clears throat> we're watching this and we see Marilla's reaction to the ups and downs of Anne, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, part of me thinks that Marilla is actually thinking, I need to get her to a psychiatrist. <laughs> now. She really will poison the well if I keep her at the... Well. Absolutely. There, and there is a certain freneticism to the way her mind works, just bouncing from topic to topic and idea to idea. And then the, the idea that if your hair color doesn't change, that's a hope lost. Like, yeah. You know. <laughs> How... Uh, how seriously do you take things in your life? <laughs> well, from her statement, it, you know, it really gives you, it, it's that continuing idea that like, Anne is willingly being plucky yeah. as she can mm -hmm. because the grim reality is just a hair's width below the surface. Yeah. Well, and the reality is she has no self-worth. Everything about her is wrong. <laughs> Her hair color, the fact that she's a girl, <clears throat> all of those things she sees as bad. Yeah, right. And then to, to kind of dive further into psychology, she is far more interested in being a heroine in a book and the escapism than in the things going on in her life. Yeah. Yep. Very reasonably. <laughs> and there we go again. 
right? Mm -hmm. I'm not right. interesting. My imagination's far more interesting than my life is. Move, I hope. That wonderful coping that Anne has where she layers over that from the reality of things. Oh. And and again, you know, she's been in these very uh, these environments and with these experiences that are, as we'll see momentarily, um, that are very stifling. And so, of course, she escapes into fantasy worlds. Who wouldn't want yeah. to do that? I think the Cinderella kind of thing, where it's like, you know, I'm I'm a scullery maid to my family by force, and I've got all these wonderful things I can imagine <coughs> about magical mice and godmothers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah. Why is Marilla asking her this? If um, she wants to give Anne up. Why? Why find out this exactly. detail? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now. The other side of that coin is Myrtle is a very practical person. She's like, if, if we're going to talk, reveal some factual information to me because that seems to be, you know, and I, I only trust you to know your own biography. Anything else you'd go off on in wild tangents on. So there is a reasonable side of it. The other to that point is maybe there's something in her wondering if there's something worth saving here. Hmm. She's a woman with a startling lack of imagination, so yeah. Anne's prattling on about imaginary things. I could see being very grating on her <laughs> on her personality. Exactly. Anne talking back and resisting an instruction from an adult. Yeah. Mm. Um, several of them. It's like re repeated, you know, oh, go ahead, tell me. Um, it's also interesting here seeing, seeing how Marilla is handling this whole conversation where Marilla is consistently truthful with Anne um, and has a very adult conversation with her. You know, here's what's going on. Where's White Sands? Five miles. Then we get that, you know, it, it's, she's answering questions very, you know, she's not shutting out Anne in any way. Um, right. But then, um, and then when Anne talks back, Marilla does not say, how dare you, child? Mm. She just, huh, that's odd. Why did you do that? Basically is her reaction. Um, so it's, it's a, a, you can tell Marilla knows there's a lot more going on here than is on the surface. Yeah, because she might not be the most emotional woman in the world, no. but she isn't angry mm -hmm. with Anne. Yeah. She just sort of persists to find mm -hmm. out the information. Yeah. So. Notice they're like talking literally over her. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's like like she's a a a chair. Yeah, you know, it's like this is not, you know. Oh, this 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 thing. Yeah. This thing? Yeah. This this mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This thing. Yeah. It was all a mistake. You know. They screwed up. They gave me this. this is this that the thing you don't girl. want? Yeah. yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> but also notice Marilla's reaction there, where when this woman starts talking to her, like the first thing she does is glance down at Anne, like, why aren't you acknowledging Anne? Like it's kind of an yeah. odd thing. And then the woman kind of insults Rachel. And so Marilla has to get, no, 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 no. You know, Rachel is an idiot. Right. Like, I have to respond. And, but then now you're in that conversation back and forth. And obviously Marilla could have done a lot more here to sort of yeah. protect Anne and so forth. But it's but interesting. It also, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. That's it. No, what I was going to say, but it's kind of interesting how, like, maybe this is the part where she starts as she's maybe, you know, sometimes yeah. you have to sound things out. Like, you have to say it out loud before you hear it, if you yeah. know what I mean. Yep. And maybe as soon as she starts talking, maybe Marilla will be like, like oh, crap, this is a human being. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, and this, as we've talked about before, and right, you've said a lot about a turning point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This feel you could see that the way that Anne is presented mm -hmm. Anne's not happy no and I don't mean just generally about the, the about having to go back to the the orphanage but in this conversation Anne is not happy mm -hmm. and for Marilla this might it feels like this might be a point a turning point mm -hmm. where you've got that conversation through her over her around Anne and it's like she's starting to turn you know it's like mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I appreciate like, your help for yeah. causing this trouble. Yeah, I, I like Marilla's expression here too. Like, uh, yeah. um, you suck. <laughs> but, but again, even in this, when Anne yeah. runs off, there's a chance Anne could run. Yeah. I mean, that's the the reality. She could bolt and just never come back. Marilla does not 
jump out of the wagon, scream and run after her. She just calls after her and then sits. Yeah. And it's like, hmm. You're have you gained, even in just this slight experience with Anne, a little insight into Anne's character. Yeah. To know that she's not gonna bolt. Mm-hmm. That you just kinda have to wait for Anne to work through whatever she's mm-hmm. doing internally. Mm-hmm. And then you can re-engage her re-dialogue. Yeah. So. And I just love the framing of that, how small Anne is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's this tiny thing in a huge, wide-open world. And it's very much what she's feeling right now. Yeah. And I think given that it's from Morella's perspective yeah. as well, mm-hmm. that she, you it, it feels like she's recognizing that exact same thing. Yeah. How small Anne is in all of this. Yeah. How a... a, a She's just been talked over, talked around, and about. Mm-hmm. And Anne is just this little tiny part of the, whatever else is going on. And it's like, Marilla's kind of got that. Yeah. Yeah. There's lovely symbolism here in how all this is arranged in the storyboarding sense, right? Anne has her back to Marilla. Right? She's kind of refusing this. Marilla is, is pointing towards Anne, um, but looking away from her. Yeah. In that very pensive way and there's this giant gap between them like in every sense but I completely agree I think Marilla is processing at this point yeah yeah because I mean this from what the perspective we get this is a big field yeah you know what I mean this is one of those things where you could have any given kid in Walmart just take (laughs) off (laughs) yeah and parents screaming after them and running but no you, and you're you're absolutely right. There's this gap, but they're also still in the same visual space. Yes, absolutely. So they are still framed. There is space between them. They haven't come mm-hmm. to an understanding of each other yet. Yeah. But they are still together. Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm. great point. And to that point, you know, this this scene is kind of dragging on. What is Marilla not doing? She's not hurrying in. She's not pushing her. She's like, okay, you need some time. Uh, let me let me give you some time. Especially given how she, like, she just said, I'm in a hurry. And just from an animation perspective, you have a moving shadow. Mm-hmm. In the foreground, you have moving moving cattails, I'm assuming. Yep. Um, and then in the background, you have clouds. Yeah. Anne is completely still. The mm-hmm. horse is no longer moving its head up and down eating. It is mm-hmm. all like a flat frame in the middle ground. Mm-hmm. So background, clouds, front, foreground, you've got that. So it's like, yeah. Okay. You're giving us a lot of time to visually absorb what's going on with these people. And you think, to make that cloud happen, they had to recolor all of this. Right. This cell had to be colored over multiple times to make that happen. It's amazing. And man, as a kid, how many times did you need this? You know? Just time to stop and think and look up at the sky and process for a while. So important. Wow. Mm. An apology. Yep, you're absolutely right. She was... Marilla realized that she was not paying attention to Dan. Yep. Yeah. And, and to go on further, never cared for your feelings. Yeah. Like, hmm. So this has been quite a journey. Mm-hmm. So at the start of this, I would imagine she would have been much harsher. But in yeah. just this short journey, <clears throat> you've seen already progression in her character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But is Anne picking up on something? Because mm. Marilla didn't yell at her. Yeah. Marilla didn't come out there and smack her around, like get your ass back in the you know buggy. True. So that Anne has had that moment to think, to calm down. But she's also kind of recognized, okay, you know, maybe this, I'm recognizing this is the point where I should open up some more because Mm -hmm. this is a different acting person that has not been this way to me before. Mm -hmm. She just apologized to me. So it's like, this is my opportunity to to get in and Mm -hmm. see what I can do. It's definitely an an olive branch relationally to say, you know, you asked for this, I'm giving that to you. And we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. Also revealing about Marilla. Um, you know, besides the practicality, she's much more concerned with who you are as a person. Yeah. Right. Um, 
um, how do you behave as a person, which I think ties back to what we saw before of her observing Anne in the kitchen, observing her behavior here. She wants to know who Anne is, not what people have said about her. She's judging her on the content of her character yeah. rather than her, like right. Anne is afraid of, red hair, being a girl, yeah. these these external factors. That, and yeah, but Marilla seems to be delving a little. Mm -hmm. Which is good. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. The detail. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. I just have to point out all the effort they put into just that one shot. Holy smokes. Yep. Importantly, what they're establishing here is we've seen glimpses of Anne's um, sort of fantasies and so forth. We've never gone inside her head to this level. And we see how incredibly detailed her imagination is. Uh, and that's not a that, that's not saying anything bad about her. It's saying she has that capacity to fully realize these things. Um, you know, just showcasing how powerful her mind is. Yeah. Well, it's also the the element where she said she's thought she's never seen it, but she's thought about it so much, and it's like. Yeah. That also harkens back to the fact that she's had some very bleak times. Mm -hmm. So constructing this level of detail yeah. is a wonderful thought exercise that mm -hmm. allows you to engage your mind, yeah. engage your imagination, and not deal with the bleak crap she's been through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, notice there's no one there. Yep. A smile out of Marilla. Yeah. A softer look out of Marilla. Yeah. So not just the smile, but her face softened at that. 100%. And I think also there's something to Anne saying, I was scrawny as a baby, but I'm scrawny now. The self-awareness of that, right? Of being able to take that imagination of, of what you were like and then bring it forward to yourself, compare yourself to it. That's pretty mature. Yeah. And that is a statement straightforward. Because Anne feels, yeah. you know what I mean, this kind of feeling of like, I disappointed you because I'm not a boy. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's very interesting because Marilla saying any anyone would love their child. Yeah. Where it's like, so, you know, you get the feeling of like, so if you had had a child, mm -hmm. Anne was your child, you would love her without without reservation. Yeah. But you're, you're kind of not there yet mm -hmm. to recognize mm -hmm. Anne as your child. Anne, on the other hand, is very acutely aware of how disappointed you are in her and hence this is not a mean comment it is a right. very self-aware comment yeah. right great point there's a thousand mile stare from marilla realizing what this is well and a well done slow mm -hmm. head turn to look forward like mm -hmm. gears are turning exactly <laughs> just <laughs> A little more, a little more clear. <laughs> Let me just spread this out a little thicker. Okay, here we go. Uh, turn that bayonet a little bit more. And there's another image of all the adults talking, you know, separate from Anne. I do like the way that they're in. Sh there's shadow and light on mm. them, but Anne has a very distinct sort of key light on her. Yeah. Like, there's not a part of her that's shadowed or light. She is all bathed in glow mm -hmm. through the bas in the bassinet. Yeah, they, so, they've given her lighter colors. Yeah. 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 So, watching this particular scene, um, if you're a Full Metal Alchemist fan, mm. this is going to remind you of the scene when the, the brothers, the Elric brothers, they were older when their mother died. <clears throat> but they were, like, you know, like, young, like, under 10 but this is the scene. It was a whole bunch of people kind of waiting for the death to happen, wow. for the mother to pass away, and for them to try and figure out what to do with the brothers. Gotcha. Mm. Yeah. It all comes back to Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> Notice how the, the focus is on Anne. Mm. Now that it's getting into this sort of critical phase of Anne's story, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not watching the road. Yeah, you're just true. watching Anne. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Mm. And even Marilla is pointing our attention to Anne. Yeah. You're right. 
interesting how when Anne has difficulty continuing her conversation, she needs nature. Um, she needs not just to pause, but also to gather her thoughts by reconnecting with the world around her, if you will. Um, right. but, but not other people, like just the natural world that seems to center her. I want to point out like the camera obscura kind of thing going yeah. on here. And it's and they're definitely using like you know, the shades of, of tone for uh, in coloring to say okay here's the past and but we have this like camera lens that seems to go yeah. focusing in yeah you're absolutely right very kind of silent film esque yeah yeah you're absolutely right and also just the boy the uh, symbolism of this image of this yeah. very young girl having to do labor <laughs> um, well caring for children when she is just a child yeah mm. and it's like oh mm. but also like notice her expression right like she's not crying she's not this is just what she does this is yeah. this is the deal then she'll do then she'll do that I'm sorry I just got I, in my mind I just got real bleak here <clears throat> like mm -hmm. did you fall under a train well so this is the thing is was he drunk, drunk and, and tripped, and tripped? Right. Or did he just go, nope? You know, um, you do not accidentally fall under a train. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> either he was so incredibly drunk, or he 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 uh, he had intention. Yeah. yeah. He was tired of lots of children in poverty and decided mm -hmm. to uh, take a vacation permanently. Mm -hmm. yeah. The children. Mm -hmm. look obviously distraught yeah is Anne's face distraught over death or is Anne's face distraught over a little of death and now what 100% that I think this is more oh no what will I have to do now it's yeah. even more safety has been taken away from yeah. me uh, yeah because I, I get the feeling like the natural born children yeah. it's more the horror of dad's death mm -hmm. versus Anne where it's like there's a complication here yeah because if they if the Mr. and Mrs. Thomas were already poor mm -hmm. now there's only Mrs. Thomas yeah and that's going to make them even more poor which is two things one is um shows Anne's intelligence when she's thinking through all this also notice Anne is the oldest of all the kids here. Yeah. Uh, so there's a certain responsibility she's clearly feeling for the other kids, and so it's her processing all of those, you know, all the all the, the math of what's happening going to happen for all of them. Yeah, which is yeah. a lot to ask for a kid her age. Absolutely. We'll point out the imagery here of winter. You know, it's clearly a winter time for Anne, very mm -hmm. symbolically. Um, but also, you got, got to appreciate the writing here where, yeah, Mrs. Thomas is at her wit's end. Absolutely. Right? She just lost her husband, the breadwinner. Well, kind of. Um, but, you know, that connection, she has three other kids to, to, to handle. Anne would be a, I hate to use the word burden, but she has this complication yeah. to all of this another mouth to feed she doesn't have the feed to feed mm -hmm. yeah and she's not you know abandoning Anne in the woods right, right? she's saying oh, well I'm, I'm gonna you know you are an orphan I'm gonna have to take you to an orphanage it's it's terrible but it's understandable although now that you said that Brett it makes me you know focus in on the fact that these are the woods well yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not well, yeah. abandoning her alone in the woods yeah but it is, it, you're you know you're you know by saying that she did abandon her in the woods now mm -hmm. off and is a left this second family right yeah. and it has to go off somewhere so it was, it was well done <laughs> thank you <laughs> how much of those stumps is a representation of growth and life and progress cut mm -hmm. short yeah Great. You know what I mean? So this land of stumps is what we're burgeoning trees growing towards a, yeah. a, a splendid sun have all been cut down 
felled before their time. Like Anne's, you know, her romantic dreams of everything so, you know, gone away from her. A perfect graveyard of dreams, of, of hopes. Exactly. Dead hopes, yep. <sighs> and adding the other connection there, um, what does Anne love above, above everything else? Nature. Yeah. You know, and she's surrounded by, by nature being destroyed. Yeah. I just have to appreciate what they did with the look of horror in Anne's eyes at the idea of yeah. more kids. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. That lady had twins three times. Mm. Good night in the morning. Oh, God. Even the other kids are a little bit like, really? Another <laughs> one? Another two? How does this keep happening? <clears throat> well, you see, when a man loves a woman, no. <laughs> No one is taking Anne to the asylum. Yep. She, she has to go by herself. Also notice that I am sure it's not accidental that the orphanage, the asylum, is in Hope, Hope Town. Town. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just look at that image. Shock of lock full of orphans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's like... I just went from a whole bunch of babies. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh. And you think about, you know, how much death this girl has been through already. Yeah. But also, notably, all father figures. Yeah. All right. So that stability that the father figure is supposed to present, particularly in the relationship, just keeps getting cut down. You know, over yeah. and over. Well, also from her vivid imagination of the little yellow house. Yeah. All in color, all beautiful. Mm -hmm. As this has just progressed to stage to next stage, it goes all sepia tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it just gets colder. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it, I kind of thought it was a passage of time where, you know, she's watching the babies mm -hmm. or she's with the drunk family. Yep. But it's like, it seems like you go from what is a warm spring in mm. Anne's recollections mm -hmm. to this increasingly, like, spring, the summer of, of this memory is wonderful. And then she goes to the next family and it starts to become mm. fall. Yeah. She goes to the next family, it gets bleaker and colder. Mm. And now she finally gets to the orphanage and it is frozen. I think it's you know? not only just, you know, the seasons, but... You know, there is no imagination here. Yeah. Well, that's what I'd no. say. You know, like the glaciation yeah. of it. She yeah. goes from these warm thoughts and concepts to things get yeah. increasingly bleak. Yeah. Where there's nothing, yeah. there's no color to it, there's no interest mm -hmm. to it, there's no imagination to it. It is all the harsh and stark reality of it. Yeah. And that is a cold, hard truth if yeah. you really want to look at it uh -huh. in that kind of perspective. Yeah. I mean, you think about. Um, what we've seen of um, Avonlea so far, how right. buildings are set up, the vegetation that are around buildings. Yeah. You know, there are trees around. There are like, even in, in the winter, you would see, you know, ground cover, all various things, bushes, etc. Nothing. Yeah. This is ground and boards. That's it. And so many kids. And so many kids. Was there like a cholera outbreak at this time or something? I mean, why are there so many? There would be fewer children if there was a cholera outbreak. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Only one face of the window. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> um, but it's also kind of a you know reminder of how hard it was to get adopted back then. Yeah. yeah. Um, there were far less lucky kids. Yeah. So to speak. That's true. Well, working in a coal mine is luck. <laughs> or a woolen mill. I mean, small hands make light work, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was also thinking about just, you know, living on the street. Yeah. You need shoe shines and pickpockets, so there's <laughs> one. <Gah. laughs> so much for Hope Town. Mm hmm. John, to your point, she just made a turn. Oh, yeah, you're right. Good observation, <laughs> man. Yeah. Because I was just thinking, Marilla's 
tone of voice has gotten softer. Yeah, it has. Ooh. I like that. Yeah. Great insight, Steve. Um, and you also noticed what she didn't say. Um, I mean, she didn't comfort her, but I don't know that Merlin knows how to do that. Yeah. Um, but she basically says, okay, change the subject a bit. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's, let's not dwell on those memories. What about school? Lots of kids like being at school. They like learning. You know, you talk about books a lot. Sorry. Um, something fell. Um, and this is where you see the hands come up from behind <laughs> Brent. <laughs> oh my god, no! Um, but, you know, Anne talked about books a lot. Clearly she's educated in some way. Very reasonable question. Mm. There's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Because that's actually probing into trauma. Mm. Right? That, that's saying, okay, all that bad stuff happened. <clears throat> like... You haven't really talked much about their behavior. Were they traumatizing too? Interesting. And it's a much more personal question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going to school. Tell me about when you when we were born. Where'd you grow? Yeah. Now we're, we've peeled a layer off. Now it's like, were the people in these stories good to you? How do you? perceive their behavior towards you. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's very personal. It's getting mm-hmm. much more personal. Yep. What a revealing expression for man. Right. Um, that is the expression of a child who wants to say something but knows it's not socially acceptable. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, defending. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure they meant to be. Mm. When you slap me around like Anthony. <laughs> but again, this is showing certain emotional maturity. Yeah. Where Anne's, Anne's not lashing out at them. She's defending them, but also saying they did not have easy lives either. Ooh, and here we get the shot. <clears throat> she's already made the turn. She's already delving. And she's really working hard on how to process exactly what to do about her her feelings now towards yeah. Anne. Mm-hmm. Further, the fact that like one of the things we've seen about Marilla is her concern about appearances, um, you know, about uh, telling the truth, about things like that, and her, her behaviors in general. And so seeing how Anne dealt with that question um, in a politically sophisticated way, if you will, yeah. <laughs> um, in a way that, that I mean, is well mannered, would be I think the way of putting it. Um, I think that raises Anne in her estimation as well. I kind of want. And this is just purely speculative mm. because there's there's no, nothing in here yeah. um, that would give us greater insight into that. But mm. does Marilla see some of what the potential future could be mm. with Anne? Right. So she has asked this question: Were they good to you? casting forward a little oh, what will happen yeah. when people ask Anne was I good to her that's a great will point mm-hmm. Anne throw me under the bus and be like yeah. oh she was the worst human ever mm-hmm. or will Anne do the same thing yeah. Marilla had a lot of things to deal with Matthew wasn't that well she had the farm she meant to do the best that she could do under the circumstances so she's that's Marilla's fantastic. thinking about all of this casting it forward again I have no idea sure no idea just yeah. No way of knowing. You know, that's a fantastic insight that, that that question would reveal to Marilla, whether she intended or not, that Anne is would be forgiving of a mother figure who is not perfect. Right. Yeah. And that would sustain if Marilla is that is conscious of how she appears. Yeah. That would sustain her image of herself mm-hmm. going forward, that Anne would not speak ill of her that Anne would speak understandingly of her, so that would retain her self-perception. Yeah. So. Yeah. Great point. Do you think Marilla chose the shore road versus the shiny lake as <clears throat> kindness to Anne? Interesting. I don't because think so. Because this is before the turn. This right. is before she had right. that yeah. deeper dialogue going on mm-hmm. within, within herself. 
mm -hmm. um, monologue, whatever. Um, but that she took the shore and said, "And no, we're not going that way." Is it just purely because that's where White Sands is, and that the shore of the road was the most pragmatic approach, mm -hmm. or was there already an element of might as well make the last journey pleasurable for mm. her? I, I don't, don't see that in Maroa at this point. Okay. Personally. Um, uh, it just doesn't seem... She seems too practical for that. Okay. Yeah. I was saying, because it would be a nice send-off to be like, we're not just going to take the inland road with nothing to really look at. We'll take the shore road. So mm -hmm. that you can get you know, a view of the sea, a lovely view of the sea, before I send you off to the orphanage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I am rereading this now. Uh, there is no indication in the book um, that there was anything there. It's just, no, we're, we're going by that route. <clears throat> right. Um, Which fits character-wise at the beginning of the journey, her absolute, that is the most practical way to go versus... But I just, it, it made me wonder, because the shore route would seem to be a lovely way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I will now quote this point in the novel. Marilla asked no more questions. Anne gave herself up to silent rapture over the shore road, and Marilla guided the sorrel abstractedly while she pondered deeply. So this is direct quotes in the book. Word for it. Um, then, pity was suddenly stirring in her, Marilla's heart, for the child. What a starved, unloved life she had had a life of drudgery and poverty and neglect, for Marilla was shrewd enough to read between the lines of Anne's history and divine the truth. No wonder she had been so delighted at the prospect of a real home. It was a pity she had to be sent back. What if she, Marilla, should indulge Matthew's unaccountable whim and let her stay? He was set on it, and the child seemed a nice, teachable little thing. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. It is breaking through to her at this point. It's interesting here how we're staying away from these characters. Yep. Camera's staying very far away, and I think that's doing a couple of things. We've already seen so much of Marilla's and Anne's expressions already. We know where both Anne and Marilla are emotionally, so more shots of Marilla being pensive aren't going to give us any more information. Right. Instead, this gives us a bit more of a space to think and process emotion about what's going on so, so far. And to think about, okay, what is Marilla planning to do next? Sell her off to pirates to Shanghai. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. She'll be a fine scholarly maid. No. Um, well, uh, this... She's going to become Anne Bonny. Wait a minute. <laughs> hey. uh, you could argue this is setting off on a journey. Yep. Right? We're, we're sailing away, literally. Perhaps. Fire a broadsides at the, at the <laughs> Take out those scallywags. What are you doing, you idiot? <laughs> we get that move from, would it be great to be a seagull? Would it be all yeah. the, oh, I thought that was the orphanage. Like, mm -hmm. s snapping back. Yeah. And Marilla, again, sort of like, hmm. Mm -hmm. And even further back from the, than that, uh, the fact that after Anne relates all of this trauma she's been through, you know, not that long after, she's enjoying the seaside, she's enjoying watching the gulls, that resilience she has. Um, some might call it just being able to bounce back and forth from one thing to another, like a ping pong, ping pong ball, but still. Right. Well, given the very button-down life that Marilla and Matthew live... Um, Marilla recognizes, you know, Matthew's weakness to these sort of romantic kind of things. Sure. And it's just, it's, it's interesting to think that, you know, what part of all this, considering Anne's background, considering her own brother, mm -hmm. like the way that he reacts with things, yeah. if she doesn't in a caring sense in her way of caring, mm. see that Anne is is the kind of imaginative emotional faucet that they need to, to bring something to their lives. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? It's like, so you just, it, I just have such a feeling of all the gears that are turning in Marilla's <laughs> mind where it's like, good God. <laughs> and just give me five minutes. Shut up. I just really think about this. <laughs> I think that's the hardest thing you could ask for, man. Yeah. Shut up for five minutes. <laughs> Stop talking about gulls. <laughs> okay, so that is episode four of Anne of Green Gables. Again, I mean, this is a whole episode that is entirely a trip in a carriage from one place to another. Yep. Yeah. Um, the fact that these creators can do this is pretty amazing um this is one chapter of the book um is literally this 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 period and the fact they've managed to make this so engaging for the entire time is really remarkable yeah well it does make make me ask the question who was this geared towards Hmm. because if you said would 10 year old kids boys and girls sit and watch this whole episode and be riveted to it. I think so. Because I think as an adult, I got a lot out of what's going on in just this journey. If I was yeah. expecting, you know, Vegeta to, like, knock somebody <laughs> into the sun, <laughs> as a 10-year-old boy, I'd be like, yeah. no, I'm done. This is just this is too much talky. There's not yeah. enough action. It's like... <clears throat> I think a lot of kids are capable of... of, of staying with it, especially because um, this is about a kid. Mm. Um, and so I think you can relate to Anne more directly as a kid. Um, okay. Because you've had those feelings in the past. Steve? Yeah, I was going to say, I th- I think in uh, what, what, what year does it come out again? 79? 70, 79. 70, 79. I think that kids would have watched this eagerly um, and and because just because of the scope of the time, you know, when was this? If you're in Japan and you've already experiencing people wanting to go to Switzerland because of Heidi, or mm-hmm. you know something of that nature, this is another location. This is Canada. This is yeah. this is you know. Notice how they make um, you know. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny. Like, yeah, the Americans show up here during this. <laughs> you know, but but to the point being that okay, here's another pristine place. Here's a heroine that you have that goes here, and these are things that uh, I think Japanese kids aren't going to see or aren't going to know. Like if you're Canadian or American living on the East Coast, mm. these are familiar yeah. sights to you. Okay. For for a Japanese kid, this is not that yeah. ship is not Japanese. That ship. Okay, is so you're not. saying sort of the exotic locale. Yeah, provides and, and some of its own element to it. Okay. Right, and trying to understand and and you know and it's weighed in by the fact that Anne of Green Gables has such an impact in Japanese schools. True. So the kids are gonna are probably this was probably something. Uh, this is what they did with us with. Um, 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 the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mm-hmm. We were actually read the book in the school, mm-hmm. as PBS was showing the, the cartoon. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. this might be a, a, a thing where they where you know they made this, and people and teachers were probably like going, "Oh God, yes, okay, have the parents watch, <laughs> you know, sit there with the kids watching this and reading the book." Yeah. But you know, kind of a thing. So this is so there is already a sort of fan base for this story. That has not had that was not represented with a visual before in Japan. Mm. So here you have it. Uh, so I, I think it's yeah. so I think kids would 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 enjoy that. Yeah, hundred percent agreed. Also, let's be honest, more girls than boys. Yes, right. This, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. aimed at yeah. a girl demographic. Yeah, there. And when they start getting into the MMA fighting, I think that's where they right. brought the boy demographic. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, when this went shown boxing it. gloves, you know. Really, like, <laughs> going places. Well, and, and, and that time period too. I'm sure. I watched a lot of things when I was a kid because it was animated. True. Yeah, Not right. necessarily because the content. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't want to watch something else. I didn't want to watch a game show. I didn't mm-hmm. want to watch like a, a TV right. movie. I didn't want to watch this. I yeah. I watched plenty of stuff that was just I don't remember at all. Mm-hmm. But it was animated. Yeah. So it's, I could also see 
there being an element of that where it's like, oh, you kids are learning about Anna Green Gables. Here is a way. It's kind of like a visual cliff notes for mm-hmm. you. Yep. And it's animated. You don't want to watch another game show, right? You don't want to watch another who's going to go into Keshi's castle. So just <laughs> here you go. Here's Anna Green Gables. Yeah, um, I think so too. And I think to Steve's point um, more broadly, the idea of it being a great classic also helps that a lot. I think a lot of parents would just sit their kids down in front of this because oh, it's Anne. It's a it, it's a right. it's a classic children's book. So you should watch this, uh, you know, regardless of school or whatever. Right. Um, it's educational. Right. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to worry about you watching some mindless drivel. <laughs> we want you to watch something that'll expand your mind. Mm-hmm. And, by the way, Bren, thank, uh, and by the way, Brent, and by the way, Brent, thank you for 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 putting us at this particular scene with this particular <laughs> subtitle. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll do something just uh, much much happier. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you'd stop on the train scene where you got hit by a train. <laughs> oh, that's much happier. Oh, God. There we go. No. Um, yeah, well, th- that speaks actually to the difficulty of adapting this chapter to this episode. It's a downer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so finding ways <clears throat> of keeping it entertaining, for lack of a better word, uh, was really challenging. And you see how they do that by bouncing back and forth between current times and the memories and right. pulling it back and, and really giving us a lot of time with Marilla's reactions to things to make you realize, oh, we're not just wallowing in Anne's past. This has a potential purpose in breaking down Marilla's walls. Hmm. I do also wonder for its time period. We've got Gundam 79. Yeah. We've got uh, Space Battleship Yamato. 74. So, it's, it's interesting to think about the emotional mm. connectivity yeah. for Anne in its time period. Mm-hmm. So that uh, one of the things about Robotech that was, it, it, you know, I've seen said before and we've mm-hmm. discussed is that for a space opera with romantic elements to it, yeah. it hit a, a particular chord. Mm-hmm at least on this side of the, of the Pacific, certainly <laughs> Macross did way before we got to it, but it hit an emotional chord because you didn't have that kind of similar content. Mm-hmm. So it's like having an emotional investment and a vehicle to do so makes for a very nice watch. Yeah. So Gundam has a lot of connectivity, a lot yeah. of, a lot of emotional content. So does mm-hmm. space battleship Yamato. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wonder if, this was a different kind of emotional connectivity that doesn't involve spaceships exploding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like you can you can invest in this emotionally and and sadness, mm-hmm. but not the you know harsh reality of war. Mm-hmm. Well, what you know, as you were saying that, John, I was thinking to something that Brent had said earlier, which was, okay, this is more for girls than it is for boys. Now I'm kind of thinking, well, what if this was made for girls like like okay yeah. we've got battleship Yamato mm-hmm. out there we've got gundam out there um we have a whole other market out there which are <laughs> girls that we're just not you know how do we how do we do this yeah yeah then mm-hmm. there you go yeah um i would also argue that yamato and um other shows at the time were melodrama yeah mm-hmm. while Anne and gundam are drum okay yeah, uh, where you get more sophisticated emotional content at this point, um, and so you're 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 drawn into these three dimensional characters who right. are, are dealing with these things, um, and and that's where you're starting to get. That. But I, I completely agree with you, Steve. I think this is the shoujo Gundam, if you will, yeah. in that <laughs> sense, where it's like, okay, we have the capacity to tell these more complicated. And I think you go back to Heidi. It's also 1974. Um, as lovely as that show is, um, it's telling these very simple stories with these characters. Right. Uh, it doesn't have the emotional sophistication. And granted, uh, Heidi is, I think, five or six in there. Um, so now you're telling stories about an 11-year-old girl, and then you know she, she gets older. Um, you need more emotional sophistication for those stories 
now we can we can tell those stories and now appeal to that audience that wants something right. a little more. God, this is also interesting. Imagine... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, can you just imagine if they actually did get the rights of Pippi Longstock? Pippi Longstock. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Jesus. <clears throat> Can I don't knock Pippi Longstock. Mm -hmm. um, it, given where this occurs with the other, with mm -hmm. more gendered demographics yeah. developing in the late 70s, it's an interesting um, greater emotional impact. Mm -hmm. as we're journeying out of the 70s into the 80s to mm -hmm. see like the more nuanced emotional connection that you can make the deeper yeah. uh, character developments that you get out of sort of these longer story forms mm -hmm. and much, le much less um, short form shallowness and, yeah. and reactive kind of thing something that gives you a little more depth and it's that seems to be interesting that these late seventies had generated a lot of these shows that seem to have been big into getting the ideas going, where you could adapt um, an entire generation of kids from silliness into something where it's like I really understand the character, I understand the background, I understand where it's coming from, and I can identify with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, and getting back to that point about sort of melodrama versus drama and girls versus boys. What's the other big shoujo anime of 1979? Rosa Versailles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. And that's 100% <clears throat> melodrama. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No question. But that is action and, 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 and suspense and all these things going on. And that isn't, I think that is an attempt to be more flashy, right? To be more, mm. we're going to throw lots of, of very in-your-face elements at the audience, and that has a place, right, for this very strong, almost telenovela level emotions <laughs> uh, in a story. Anne says, let's do a much more deeply psychological story where we're just indwelling in these very naturalistic human characters. Yeah. Uh, you know, no one leaps 20 feet in the air from a standstill <laughs> in, in Anne of Green Gables, right? Really, not that, not that we've seen so far. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not yet. That's it's, it's fair. I mean, Anne did come in on a magical carriage floating above the road, so we've already hey. got the, we've got the precedent. She is technically a magical girl, isn't so, she? So, by the way, John, when you asked if that was an actual real carriage, as near as I can tell, it isn't, but it's based off of Skulky, which is a racing yeah. carriage. Oh, yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Did not know that. Or I think they also refer to it as a trap. Yeah. Which okay. is just a, oh, yeah, a yeah. seat, a, a box trap or something. Where it's just a yeah, seat just in seat. a box with wheels. And yeah. you can hold two people, maybe three, if you cram people in there. But it's just, it's very small. Yeah, sulky racing used to be a big thing at Brandywine Sulky Park yeah, okay. outside of Wilmington. Interesting. Um, the other thing is I'm actually just doing a little research now. And I'm trying to think of major shoujo anime of the 1980s. And they're there, but there's not much. It's mostly Magical Girl. Um, it's yeah. just scattered stuff at that. You really don't see um, a lot of iconic shoujo. You see a few, but just, you know, thinking back, you know, there's, you, know you think in the 90s you get Fushigi Yugi and Sailor Moon and all of these yeah. different things. Um, I feel like it took, a, it took longer to get a robust um, shoujo medium going if you will, uh, because it took him a while to, to figure out what is what is our what is our approach. How do we how do we cash in? I mean, <laughs> talk, to our, talk to our key demographic. Yeah. How, how 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 do we much how do we improve the lives of these girls and separate them from their money? <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, and, and you know, these this is always the fun part about doing all this with you mm -hmm. guys this week, where we get this for younger set of folks that look at current shows within the last 15 years yeah. and say, oh, well, this is so different than, like, so many other things. It's like, ah, really? They were, <laughs> they were pioneering this in the yeah. late 70s to try and figure out the way to present the stories that now mm -hmm. 
you're like, well, that's just the way that that this is how anime is. Yeah. It's like, hey, no, no. Yeah. It took this developmental mm-hmm. like gestation period, and then an entirety of the 1980s with some shows that were less than entertaining mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> to get us then back into the 90s where things seem to be like more on track. Get us to the current where you've got such a breadth of different shows that address different elements of emotional connected connectivity of you know social issues of other things that it's like wow here look at these things this is where you're starting to see these (laughs) things happening absolutely you know a girl and a woman riding in a horse-drawn carriage Mm -hmm. for an entire episode to establish emotional connectivity Mm -hmm. that's like yeah and that's when you turn around and you go, I'm sorry Miku wasn't it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry there were no idols, no dancing. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, a girl and a woman riding in a carriage for 24 minutes that three middle-aged men are absolutely entranced by. <laughs> right? And that we've talked with how long now? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, like, you know, not only were they doing it, it worked. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Um. Although I feel like I need to take some Xanax, Prozac, or whatever. <laughs> well, to that and point, the hits just keep coming in, don't they? Um, don't they, Ed? Contrast that to earlier in the show, where they were coming every 30 seconds, right? Yeah. They just twisted that knife over and over and over and over. And here you feel like Takahata is pulling back a little bit. And obviously because Anne is reliving her childhood and all of that trauma, some of that is coming to the surface. But he's not twisting the knife nearly as often. No, thank God. Mm-hmm. Well, one could say the knife twisting was to get your attention. <laughs> <laughs> and now that you're paying attention, we can be a little more nuanced. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. And thank also, you. I think the the... The history is the knife. Yeah. Right. Just seeing what she lived through is, is enough to make you yeah. cry. <laughs> but yeah. also, and you know, even further, I was always impressed by having, this goes back to the novel, how nobody does anything intentionally cruel to Anne other than emotional abandonment, right? Right. But, no one slaps her around. No one, you know, puts her in physical mortal danger. None of that. Um, she's just not wanted. And she is... And she's given responsibilities that other kids at the time would have had in general, right? Like, yeah. n- none of those responsibilities were in and of themselves um, um, way outside of the norm. It's just that that's what she did all the time. That's, that was her only right. life for 10 years. So the idea that there was a, there was obviously a failure to care, but that there was not active abuse, right? right. Well, and certainly that Anne, she never once says, oh, you know, Mrs. Thomas said she didn't, she didn't want me. She didn't love me. She didn't like me. Mm-hmm. And she tolerated me. Yeah. She, you know what I mean? Her, it's all from Anne's perspective that it's like, you know, they didn't want me mm-hmm. or you know my my the people that gathered around they didn't want me but nobody ever actually said that to her face right so it's like i you know mm. it's torturous to say that to someone yeah. it's not much less torturous to know it yeah and nobody yeah. says it mm-hmm. so it's kind of like Ooh. <laughs> you know that's still wow mm. <laughs> which gets to the, to the larger point that you don't have to say something for a kid to figure it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Um, which, which the act of feeling unloved is yeah. not yeah. cool. And it's, it's the fact that, you know, love is an act, not just an emotion. You know, and they, they were yeah. not acting right. that out. Yeah. Um, you know, there are so many other ways that, 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 that those people could have behaved with Anne to make her feel appreciated, make her feel loved and not like a chambermaid right. basically yeah. with all of the same outcomes right, yeah. where still 
you know, husband dies, have to give her up, just can't, whatever. But you can imagine how Anne would have looked back on that differently if there had been more of an emotional connection to the parents. Right. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fun <laughs> Any other thoughts from the episode? I just want her to be happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is. Yeah, it gives you such a longing for for her just to, to end her the history of nightmare and just mm-hmm. to get on with living a beautiful, happy, imaginative young kid life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Even though really at eleven she's like already forty-two. <laughs> <laughs> There are times when she has an old soul inside. Yeah, her, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, hopefully episode five will put us on a better trajectory there. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> That's when the space battleship shows up and she goes off into deep space to fight aliens. <laughs> Yay! That's when <laughs> Cubay shows up. Cubay? <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Good news, Sarah has calmed down a bit, and I told her it really is my fault. I should have been watching her more carefully. She doesn't know what to do necessarily. We can replant the seedlings that she pulled up, and with her help, we'll still get far more done than if she hadn't been here. It's all right. After all, it's good to have someone else around. That'll do it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next time with episode 5 of Anne. And until then, watch more anime.